Yeah, thanks for that introduction. And uh, actually, it's many years since I, I've been back here to to meet meet with all, all, all you guys. And uh, a lot has happened in that last year. One of the things is I started a new project, which is working closely together with the which is called Singularity Day. So, as well as the chief scientist of Prince and Robotics, I'm now being the CEO of Singularity Day, which is taking a lot of my time. And, of course, these represent different aspects of the same quest to create, to create general intelligence. And what I'm going to do now is tell you a bit about what we're doing with Singularity Day and Prince and Robotics, but with a view toward elucidating broader questions, such as the ones that have been raised in, in, in the last couple of talks. Like, you know, where are we going now with AI as a whole, with the whole ecosystem, with the quest to build general intelligence, with the networking together of different narrow AIs and, and machine learning systems and proto AGIs in, in, a, in a global network. I mean, it, it's been an incredible ride for those of us involved with AI in the last few years. I mean, after many decades of relatively slow but interesting progress, things are now really taking off. It seems likely things are going to go faster and faster and faster even during the coming years, which, which means we don't have time to really like hit pause and, and reflect on what we're actually building and, and, and what we're doing and what kinds of AIs we're creating. We're going to keep moving full speed ahead, and if we don't, someone else will. But nevertheless, as we are moving full speed ahead, we do need to keep reflecting now and then about what it is we're actually building and what it is that, that, that's emerging. I mean, there's some aspects of this that, in a sense, feel out of anyone's detailed control. Things are sort of um, self-organizing in the vein of um, complex systems, as, as we heard earlier. Yet we still presumably have some causal agency to, to direct, uh, direct what happens. So I'm going to talk this year a little less about my approach to general intelligence, probably because I, I talked about it talked about it last year and I've talked about it a lot of times. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the overall ecosystem of AIs on the planet. And I think, in some sense, the real AI we're going to build is going to be, as Sudan was saying, really emergent from the interactions of a lot of different AIs out there on, on the interwebs, all connecting together, processing different people's data, interacting with different people, interacting with each other. Now, this doesn't mean that, as has happened in some interesting but naive science fiction, I mean, it doesn't mean that you know, the internet is going to suddenly wake up and, like, out of a bunch of, of you know, non-intelligent programs or, or non-machine learning or other, and suddenly the internet's like, hey, I woke up, I'm, I'm a conscious being, right? Too bad for all you, like, that, thanks for all the bits, right? It, it, it's not going to be like that. On the other hand, it also may not be the other extreme, where some guys, like, laboring away in a basement, typing on code for 10 years in isolation, somehow, you know, they release a machine with an IQ of 10 million upon the world. And I think it, it's, it's going to be more like, you know, the network of AIs on the planet does have an emergent intelligence, which you can think of as a society or economy of mind, looking beyond the intelligence of the individual AIs in there. But this global intelligence is going to be made of a bunch of, you know, a bunch of AIs doing narrow AI in specific domains, and also a bunch of AI components that are trying to do general intelligence and, 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 and learning and reasoning. So it, it's, it's going to be complicated how this overall mind network achieves achieve its emergent intelligence. And I want to talk a little bit about that now, so sort of using my work with Singularity Net as a, as a way to poke it some of these more general concepts. So one of the factors, which is, you know, ex extremely well known has been written about by a lot of people here, including the people running the Creative Description Lab. I mean, AI, like many modern platform businesses, I mean, it, it has a nature to be a winner-take-all game. Like, there's a lot of network effects in AI. There, there's a generic network, network effects that you see with any platform, which we see now growing with AI platforms, like the Alibaba AI platform that was discussed earlier today, and AWS, Google Cloud, Salesforce, a whole bunch of things. And on the other hand, there's some specific network effects with AI also. I mean, the reliance on, on big data 
is important there. More customers brings more data, which enables better services, which brings more data, and so forth. There's cognitive synergy, which, I, which I've talked about. And this I've thought about a lot in the context of just, you know, how minds work. The different components of, of a cognitive system all work together and help each other get smarter and smarter. But, of course, you know, in a complex system view, from a business view, there's also a, also a network effect. AI algorithms can leverage other AI algorithms. So once you have a bunch of AIs working together, boosting each other to get them smarter and smarter, you know, that gives you an advantage over someone else who doesn't have that. Because each, if you have a bigger AI network, which has some synergy between the AIs in it, when you add a new AI to that network, that new AI will get amplified and amplified more and more. And then, of course, there, there's meta learning, which is really interesting and it's something that big tech companies are benefiting from now. Because it, if you have data from running machine learning algorithms a million times on different data sets, I mean, even if that data is kept anonymous and then specific to the to the person who owns it, you're doing meta learning about you know how your algorithm works for data sets of that type, for that size, and, and, and that domain. And so learning to learn happens on both shallow levels, like you know hyperparameter tuning being simplified, and much deeper levels of learning, like custom inference control rules and so forth. So there's a lot of network effects here, which mean that in some sense, once a network of AIs gets traction. It's, it's really, really hard to stop. And that, that can be good or it can be bad. And one of the ways it can be bad is if the AI network get a lot of traction is based on, you know, limited ways of thinking about AI or, or limited ways of, of, of using AI to make it what be possible. Because I, I do think, regardless of all the progress we've made in the last few years, there's a lot of creative innovation still needed to take the next, next steps in AI. And I, you know, I, I, I was teaching multi-layer perceptrons back in the, in the 90s and even the late 80s. I think deep neural nets are great. I also don't think anything resembling current deep neural nets is going to solve the AGI problem. So it's, I, I think there's a bit too much emphasis on this particular class of, um, of AI technologies. And you're going to need a lot of creative thinking and making up new algorithms and then connecting different algorithms together. And I think uh, as a community, you know, how to stimulate more creative thinking in the AI ecosystem and also the transition of creative ideas into, into, into deployment is, is important. And the winner take all dynamic, it can be great or, or it can be bad if, if, if it causes local optimum just to become entrenched due to, due to network effect. And we also see, you know, in the popular media and the popular mind today, increasing unease with, you know, big companies basically brainwashing people in, in, in some sense based on, on having collected their data and utilizing I mean, can, collecting it mostly with, with, with people's consent, but without people's full understanding of, of, of what's going on. And, of course, there's close connections between military and surveillance uses of AI and corporate data collection, corporate uses of AI. <laughs> there's a lot of skepticism about that. So one one possibility which ties in with my work of singularity that is that you have a key driver in the next stage of AI will be decentralized networks. And I mean this underlies the connection between blockchain and AI. Because I mean really if you get into what is what is blockchain and what is decentralized technology have to add, I mean if you distinguish decentralized tech from distributed computing, I mean, distributed computing obviously has a lot to add, and, and, and that's nothing new, right? And the decentralized aspect, which comes along with, with blockchain, really it's more about the human and the political aspect. It's about the higher level control of, of these AI, AI networks. And can you create a network of AIs and AIs learning from other AIs and communicating with, with each other, which you know, sort of grows as a digital biological organism, as a self-organizing system that it is not controlled by a single central party. And that there is there is a strong tendency due to the winner-take-all network effects in, in AI, and some of which I've enumerated, for, an, for AI to be controlled by a handful of powerful parties. But what if the notion of party can be extended? Right? What, what if it's a, a decentralized self-organizing network, which benefits from these network effects. And you have things like 
Bitcoin and Ethereum, which are interesting examples here, both from the positive and negative side, right? I mean, they're, they're interesting in that they have grown and self-organized without a central controlling authority. On the other hand, both Bitcoin and Ethereum ecosystems have a strong tendency to total monopoly. I mean, there's not that many key decision makers owning a lot of the Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. So even though they're not controlled by a company or nation state, you know, they're, they're, they're not all that egalitarian either. But on the other hand, they weren't specifically designed to be. So that there's an interesting challenge here. Like, can, can you design a decentralized AI network in a way that that is broadly participatory and acts for broad benefit? And, I mean, this is what we've been able to do with Singularity Net. I don't want to harp on that too much. You can look at it at singularitynet.io. And I talked about this briefly here last year. Now, now we, we've proceeded further with it, but the vision, the vision remains the same. And that we're, we're creating a platform in which AIs can provide commercial services to users, and AIs can also outsource work to other AIs. The idea being that you have not only a society of minds, as Sam was saying, but an economy of minds, where the economic interactions between the members of the society of minds partly serve to solve the assignment of, of credit problem in this, this overall mind, mind economy. So this is a nonprofit foundation. There's a cryptocurrency, the AGI token associated with it, which is each of token for AIs to pay other, other AIs for their work. And, you know, we're trying to get the same sort of network effects going as you have with, with any other platform, where you have consumers on the platform, you have producers putting AI in the platform, the more consumers you get, the more producers you can get, and, and, and so forth. And you know, this year we've been mostly implementing stuff. We're going to launch, launch the beta of the platform early next year. And I think some of the applications we're working on provide a window into the broader issues to do with decentralization of the old AI ecosystem. So we saw some uh, really cool human robots in the last presentation. We've been working on the Sophia robot for a while. and. One of the other things is that the on your face. Feel its presence. Feel its other things. What, what this, this, this is a snippet from two cameras showing Sophia being a meditation assistant. And you know, she looks in the person's eyes and tries to use them through various meditation and, and visualization exercises. And this I, you know, I like this because it's an example of, uh, you know, it's not the Terminator marching down, marching down the street with a machine gun. It's a robot trying to help people achieve states of, of inner bliss. And, you know, in 20 or 30 percent of the cases, uh, the, the subject can really get a, a, a profound boost in their state of consciousness from this. And, and when, when you study this uh, scientifically, I mean, the vast majority of subjects feel, you know, increase in the feeling of love and the feeling of happiness. And some people really have a transformational experience here, which is surprising to me. Because I'm a bit jaded about these robots. I, I can no longer get a transformational experience looking in the robot. I, I know what every wire inside the head is, right? But, but some people are like, well, I've been trying to meditate my whole life. I've taken classes. I've used apps. But no, this robot... Wow, and that, they, you know, that, that's really, it's, it's cool to see. It's one of many, many different applications. And so we're now working to move Sophia from the simpler chatbot software she's been running out to run on our open card cognitive engine and to use the singularity that sort of economy and society of minds to provide her with the extra cognitive abilities, much like, an, you know, an Alexa device uses various Alexa skills and, and so forth. And, and I mean, that, 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 that plays a role in these meditation applications. Also, we're working on using singularity net for genomics. And this also highlights a more general thing. I mean, when you get your DNA sequence, I mean, who, who owns that data, right? So 
I mean, there was an issue of 23 me. Now, when you use 23 me, of course, you have that sequence on your, on your own hard drive. It's not like you're giving it to them. Nevertheless, when they took the totality of the 23 me data and, and licensed it on an exclusive basis to GlaxoSmith Klein, this is not, it wasn't what I, what I was thinking when I had 23 me sequence my DNA. I mean, it's not necessarily bad. GSK is doing, doing beneficial research. And on the other hand, I would rather there was a way to take my genomic data and, you know, provide it to whatever research program I, I wanted to use. It was just more transparency and agency in the process. And this, again, is the sort of thing that a decentralized network can do, is being sure that, you know, use of everyone's medical data for discovering therapies is done in a more, in a more participatory way. And, of course, we're... We're looking at applying the network to study itself, which is one aspect of, of, of network analytics. So the whole self-organizing network of AIs should be analyzing itself and recognizing patterns of itself, which is meta-learning on the whole network level. And, you know, social credit plays an application, plays a big role here. Like you, right now you have a credit score in the U.S., which is figured by a couple companies by relatively opaque formulas. Of course, the Chinese government is famously rolling out their whole machine learning based social credit system. But really, we should be having an open ecosystem of uh, reputation agencies and social credit agencies, which are using AI in a transparent way. When you can interest the algorithm they're, they're using and why. And this, again, is an ideal application for a decentralized AI network. So I've talked about singularity yet, and some of the things we're doing here. But even though that's my own company and project, I don't think that's the end of it. And what, one thing I'm working on also is creating a new industry organization called the Decentralized AI Alliance. And what we're trying to do here is take multiple companies and nonprofit projects using AI and blockchain together in various ways and work to have them all use a common set of tools, can convert currencies and tokens together behind the scenes, have common standards and APIs. And this is really how I would like to see things evolving. It's, it's a network of networks or an ecosystem of, of ecosystems where each, each network may or may not have a cryptocurrency associated with it or its own blockchain associated with it, but these decentralized AI networks, each of which is a sort of society and economy of minds, are communicating, cooperating together, and, and, and growing together. And this is not to say that big companies shouldn't continue to exist and, 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 and play a big role in the ecosystem. It, it's to say that it may be that in order to build the future of AI that we want, which is beneficial for everyone, takes participation from everyone, and gives help to everyone, and maybe that to build this kind of network, what we want is a more decentralized ecosystem where you have a society and economy of minds composed of multiple networks talking to each other and, and organizing in, in new ways. And there's, of course, there's a lot more to this. If you look at singularitynet.io, you, you can find uh, more of my thoughts there. And stay tuned, we're going to have some big announcements from SingularityNet in the next uh, month or so, which, which may be interesting to a lot of you. Thanks a lot.